impetus to our own actions and lead us towards being an environmentally sustainable city that is good to live in and that we're proud to live in. Thank you very much. Have a great evening tonight. Thank you, Mayor Goff. So to put the conversations in Auckland Conversations, I'd like to welcome to the stage our panelists. We'll start in order here, and you can filter on the way up, and then we'll fire off questions. So the first is Malcolm Shield. He's the Climate Policy Manager at the City of Vancouver. Malcolm recently joined C40 on a two-year secondment from the City of Vancouver. He's a professional engineer, having completed his Master's of Engineering at Imperial College London. Uh, a doctorate in natural gas combustion at the University of British Columbia. Malcolm joined the city of Vancouver in 2010 and worked on the development of a carbon reduction pathway or pathways that underpin Vancouver's Greenest Cities Action Plan. Malcolm was responsible for the city's renewable energy planning and carbon management, as well as the implementation of its decarbonizing strategies. He was also responsible for the delivery of the electric vehicle strategy, which we might cover tonight, I suppose. Um, it's a multi-sector, or sorry, multi-vendor trial of electric vehicle charging infrastructure, key utility and private sector partnerships, public outreach, and building code amendments. Let's give him a quick little round of applause. <clears throat> I'd also like to welcome, I'd like to welcome to the stage Penny Nelson, who's the Deputy Secretary um, at the Ministry for the Environment. Penny, Penny is responsible for the Ministry's strategy and evaluation functions, environmental monitoring and reporting, as well as the Ministry's interests in the science system and climate change. She holds a uh, policy responsibility for hazardous substances and new organisms, marine management, and New Zealand's commitments to international environmental agreements, as well as the oversight of the Environmental Protection Authority. That seems like just about everything, actually, Penny. Um, she brings a strong focus to, uh, on building partnerships across sectors and a wealth of leadership experience in government, business, the scientific community, including with the Sustainable Business Council, Ministry for Social Development, Dairy NZ, and Land Care Research. Welcome to Penny. Let's give her a round of applause. I'd also like to welcome Ian Short to the stage. He's the former chief executive at Climate Kick in London. Ian recently stepped down as chief executive of Climate Kick, uh, Europe's largest uh, climate innovation partnership made up of multinationals, city governments, leading universities and startups. Climate Kick was established to enable Europe to accelerate innovation to market and lead the global transition to a low carbon economy. Prior to this, Ian was the CEO of the Institute for Sustainability, an independent charity established to accelerate the delivery of sustainable cities and communities. And before that, he was deputy chief executive of an urban redevelopment uh, corporation in East London that he helped, he helped establish in 2005. His background's in finance, having worked for New Zealand Treasury a while ago and a global investment bank. Let's give him a quick round of applause. And finally, I'd like to introduce to the stage Councillor Penny Holtz. Uh, she is the chair of Auckland Council's Environment and Community Committee. Penny was deputy mayor of Auckland from the formation of Auckland Council Super City until 2016. She has extensive political experience as a long-term Waitakere city councillor and deputy mayor, as a senior member of the first Auckland Council as well. Penny's committed to working across the political spectrum to achieve what's best for Auckland and its people. I would generally be shocked if you're sitting in this room and you don't know Penny and her leadership on some of the most material issues related to climate change. Please give uh, Penny a warm welcome. I'll make the seamless transition to a seat. <clears throat> there we go. So um, a few opening questions here, um, and I think I'll start right to my right. Uh, Malcolm, you've got a very interesting dual perspective with the city of Vancouver, C40. Can you tell us a little bit about C40, why it's been a useful vehicle for Vancouver and action at a city level? Maybe some practical examples of the benefits to Vancouver and how it's helped you on that journey to the world's greenest city. Thank you for that. Um, I'm indeed Malcolm Shields, uh, the Climate Policy Manager for the City of Vancouver. And first of all, I'd like to recognize that the City of Vancouver is a city that's on the land's time immemorial for the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations. The City of Vancouver has been taking action on climate change since its Clouds of Change reports in 1990. Uh, so we do have a long lineage of action and most recently, uh, we have in place our Greener City Action Plan. Uh, passed by Council in 2011, 
It's our fundamental guiding sustainability strategy covering 10 key areas from jobs, waste, transportation, carbon, right through to lighter footprint, access to nature. And so really the question comes down to how do we access a knowledge base to support those 10 different areas? And really that's what C40 provides us as a city. Uh, it's really a knowledge base and a movement. And when we look to what C40 is there to provide, it really is an NGO that is there to support cities in their movements towards a decarbonized future, towards a climate safe future. But what does that mean? How do cities actually work with that framework? Cities have common barriers. Um, as much as one city is very different to the next, the barriers preventing more rapid movement on climate change are reasonably common. So off that basis, we need to start working together better. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to learn collectively as a group. We need to start moving forward in a much more considered and cohesive fashion. So the network structure that C40 provides the city of Vancouver really allows us to get stuck into very serious conversations around what's the nature of a decarbonized transportation system? What does a decarbonized district energy uh, system look like, for example? And really C40 is there to drive home and also support us as a city in developing the evidence base for which action needs to be taken. Uh, it's about making this an apolitical movement. It's about being objective in what we need to achieve. It's about having that common basis. And so Vancouver accesses different um, facets of C40. It is that connection basis. It's about shared learning. It's about a common understanding. But then also with the space to allow some level of nuance for individual cities to get to solutions that are right for their local context. But it's also about developing the tools to support that planning process. Make sure that there's consistency and coherence around uh, our emissions, where they come from, the methodologies used to assess those. What do the different targets mean internationally? How do they relate? What is Vancouver doing in comparison to Stockholm, Oslo, Auckland, other cities around the world? And then having that coherent movement to move forward together as a group and really, I think that's where the, the other aspect of C40 provides us a lot of strength in that, unfortunately, there is still a discourse taking place about the genuine need to act on climate and the validity of the need to act on climate. And this really plays out in a very political fashion. And so it's easy to take aim at senior elected officials and say, well, is the science really settled? Yes, it is, and it has been for a long time. But mayors need support in that. And so when we look at the membership of C40, it represents over 500 million people. It's the world's biggest cities. So Vancouver is a small city, 600,000 people. Uh, we're a very innovative city. We can move quickly. But when my mayor goes out there, he can still be um, questioned as to why this is such a fundamental policy. And when he can stand beside the likes of Mayor Pais from Rio, Mayor Hidalgo from Paris, and list all these big cities and say that as a collective group, we represent the opportunity to move forward and tackle, tackle climate change. So C40 for us really provides political bench strength. It really gives us the political mandate to move forward and not just on a local basis. It's not just for us about the local conversation. Really, it's about having cities generate that um, international buzz. This is really, cities drive emissions, but they're also the center of innovation. Cities drive world innovation, and so why can they not be the source of that innovation to move forward for tackling climate change and moving forward? So it's an integration together of the political movement as well as the staff-to-staff -staff contact so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we can learn quicker, and that is out of necessity. We no longer have the luxury of time to start tackling this problem. This is no longer about incremental change as we have been making slowly since, I'd say, the early 2000s. The time is now, this is exceptionally prescient, and we now have to look to how do we take transformative action on climate. Transformative action doesn't come in its own little pockets and its own little thinking. It has to come from working together, moving together as a group, sharing our ideas and sharing our thinking. And that's really the access that, that C40 provides us. Thank you, Malcolm. 
Penny Nelson, you've also got a very interesting perspective, um, having led the Sustainable Business Council for a number of years and also formerly with the ministry and now back. Um, I'd like to believe that SBC and its members played a pretty key role in actually the Paris Agreement and actually the, the, the groundswell of support of civil society, businesses, and um, local governments to get that over the line. I like what you've written that business has to be part of the solution because businesses can't succeed in societies that fail. Now that you're back in government, there's quite a weight of responsibility uh, for you to accomplish what central government is committed to uh, in Paris. Can you walk us through how New Zealand's government, uh, clearly spearheaded by our new deputy prime minister, um, can pull this off? And uh, what's our way in? How are we going to push through to ensure that New Zealand is really a true leader in combating climate change? Thank you, John. First of all, I'd just like to acknowledge um, Auckland for the leadership that it's taking in the conversation tonight. It's a really important discussion to be having uh, this evening. i um, also like to acknowledge my um, fellow panellists. I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you this evening with such esteemed backgrounds. So um, it's a really pivotal time for New Zealand on climate change. So um, as you mentioned, my previous role was with the Sustainable Business Council. And one of the things that a range of business leaders did ahead of people going off to Paris was came together, prepared a position paper into government in terms of what they were looking for in terms of the Paris Agreement and beyond. And there was um, a lot of alignment among business leaders in terms of what they're looking for. And so now that um, I'm back working within government, um, I do feel like I'm in the hot seat to look at uh, what we can do um, from what, in terms of what a range of government agencies are doing to contribute um, into that. So, so some of what I'd like to run you through is what I'm, I've seen within um, government over the last year because I think what we're observing is um, increased urgency and there's a, there's a lot going on. So I'm going to run you through um, what, what I'm seeing. So I think the first thing is that we ratified Paris early and that was a big deal. So initially we're looking to ratify Paris in 2018 and when um, our minister was at a number of the international discussions that she was part of, it became pretty clear that it was really important for countries to come together and ratify by the end of last year. So what happened was we pulled everything forward and just went hell for leather to ratify. So that was really, really key um, thing to have happened and New Zealand's really committed to doing its part. I think the other thing is that it's really important to realise how the context has changed. So under Kyoto, climate change was an emerging issue and the countries that were signed up to that, it was for 12% of global emissions. So under the Paris Agreement, um, it covers 95% of global emissions. And I was at a presentation that EY ran last week and the, what really struck me from that discussion was the, a comment around this is a major economic disruption globally. This isn't just an environmental issue, it's an economic issue. So I think that's a really key shift that you're seeing with the Paris Agreement when you have you know, someone from a leading accounting firm talking about that that's how they're, they're seeing things. I think our, client, our targets are ambitious, so we've got targets to 2030 and 2050, and one of the things that I hear most often is, you know, we're not being ambitious enough. When um, I look at a climate target to 2030, that's 235 million tonnes, um, that's ambitious. You look at the electric vehicle package that we've got at the moment, it's 0.7 million tonnes is what it'll get us. When you look at the trees we've got grow going in the ground at the moment, that's 16 million tonnes. So, you know, quite a gap. Um, I think that target is ambitious and if we don't get there, that's, um, you know, quite a liability that goes with that. In terms of um, what's going on at the moment, what I'm seeing is huge effort from New Zealand in terms of how um, New Zealand contributes to the rule book for Paris. So, New Zealand negotiators have been really well respected for a long time. Their um, expertise has been called on for some of the really critical things that are being put in place to make Paris work. And I think we often lose sight of the, the role we play on the international stage. So um, I think that that's an important thing to uh, recognise. 
And then in terms of the, the work to, to get there for our own target, there are really three pillars that we're focused on. So international offsets, getting more trees in the ground because that buys us time, and then reducing domestic emissions. And we've had some of our team up at the discussion here today, and one of the things that they've heard is that it's a third of New Zealand's emissions come from Auckland. So um, really key role to play, and from my perspective, government needs to be um, working alongside you and really looking at how we do just what Malcolm's talked about in terms of how do we align a range of different efforts to get more transformative um, change. In terms of um, the, what we're looking at in terms of offsets, really important that as we start um, looking at linking with international markets again, that we do that in a really credible way. So some of what we're looking at is how might we do that in a new environment, and as you do that, how do you ensure that those units have environmental integrity and we're getting real mitigation from them? The other thing that we're doing a lot of work with with our colleagues from um, Ministry of Primary Industries is really looking at if we're going to get more trees in the ground because that's an important card in sync, how do you go about doing that? And we're also working with our colleagues across business innovation and employment and social development because there are also huge um, regional economic development benefits through you know, people getting jobs and also thinking about um, how that aligns in, in terms of um, social welfare. I think the biggest ch opportunities that we've got for change are in terms of um, our domestic emissions, so that's our biggest challenge and also our biggest opportunity. So a range of things that we're looking at is emissions trading schemes, so that's a really core plank of our policy environment. And already what we're seeing is that our carbon price is starting to rise based off what happened through phase one of the review of that mechanism. We're now focused on phase two and um, taking a good look at what else we can do. And there's some really key questions in there, so I'm not going to get into the technical detail, but some of the discussions that are um, being looked at you know, through there are really big questions like, you know, do, do we limit the number of international units that we can use? Um, do we need to have price controls anymore or do we need to change that? So, um, you know, some pretty fundamental questions in there. And um, our team are out there talking around New Zealand at the moment, so looking forward to getting people's input on that. What we're also recognising is that that that's a key part of what we need to do, and there's more we need to do as well. So we're looking a lot at what other non-ETS measures do we need to be taking. So um, you'll have seen that over the last year, a number of really key reference groups have been set up with a number of experts from a, from a range of sectors. So we've got a forestry reference group going. There's a um, group looking at agriculture, looking at, you know, if agriculture is 50% of our emissions, what do we do? How does it fit with the ETS? What can you do, um, you know, in, in addition to that right now? So um, really looking at that. We've also um, been looking at process heat, so what, what are some of the opportunities in there? And what we're increasingly recognising is that there's more to be done in the transport space. And also um, one of the challenges that we've had thrown at us from the business sector is, well, government's a big purchaser of services. What are we doing in the procurement space? So we're starting to get into that whole discussion around how might that be a lever for change. You'll also have seen that the, there's a cross-party group of MPs who have commissioned a piece of work out of Vivid Economics um, in the UK, and so they're starting to look at what are the long-term opportunities to reduce emissions in New Zealand. That report comes out um, in March, and we're really looking at looking forward to getting into that and really seeing what they're suggesting and, and how we utilise that. It's a, it's a key piece of work. The other reference group that has been set up, and I think this is really key for New Zealand, is um, a group of experts around adaptation. So it's recognising, um, you know, as well as looking at mitigation, we need to be looking at how we adapt. And I think that's where, you know, in terms of the discussion around impact on vulnerable communities, um, what that means for future generations, that that's a really key element. 
I think the other thing that's really key for me is we can't do this alone. Um, and what we're seeing is leadership in a range of different places, and we're really interested in looking at how we are align with that. Um, cities are a really important part of that, with, um, as Mayor Goff mentioned, a lot of the population lives here, a lot of growth's happening here, um, a lot of emissions are here, so cities are key. I remember when I was at the Sustainable Business Council hearing Peter Backer from the World Business Council saying, um, we'll win or lose sustainability in cities, so, you know, really key. Um, we've got our country report coming out on our environmental performance from the OECD next month and one of the things that they've really taken a good look at is what's the intersection between what happens with urban planning and transport and carbon emissions and we're really looking forward to looking at how that might influence where we go um, in the policy space in future. So um, I think I'm really keen that uh, we keep looking at what can government do to help you succeed here and also really keen to see you continue the momentum with a lot of the innovative things that you're doing here right now. Fantastic. Thank you, Penny. That is a very nice breath of fresh air and optimism. Um, uh, Ian, um, we'll move down the line here. Um, I see a theme here. You've got diverse multi-sector experience in this realm. So, um, hey, welcome back to New Zealand recently. Um, a lot's changed since you've left, and I guess you've left a lot of changes from where you came from. Um, I guess um, let's talk a little bit about European cities. Uh, my general sense is that we've got this fascination with what's happening pretty far away, but the connection and kind of uh, import, uh, adapt adapting the, those ideas to the current context is sometimes tricky. So um, I guess what's happening in European cities in terms of stepping up to deliver on Paris, and what's the business role in helping them get there? Okay, thanks. Thanks, John, and thanks for the invitation. I have to say, um, when I came back and I said to you, you know, please introduce me to interesting people in the climate and sustainability space so I can have a discussion. I didn't realize I'd be in front of 500 people. But um, b before I dive in, into some of what's happening in European cities, what I'm going to do is give a little bit of context of what's happening in Europe on innovation. And the reason for that is because I think it's directly relevant to the discussion tonight and what we've heard already from, I think, from the mayor and then from the first two speakers as well, and probably from um, Penny on my right too. So, as John said, uh, up until a month ago, I was the chief executive of an organization called Climate Kick. Um, and Kick stands for Knowledge and Innovation Community. There are currently six Kicks uh, and more planned. And in a sense, the Kicks are a, um, a bold experiment from the European Commission to see uh, how, through better collaboration between the research and academic world, the private sector and the public sector, we can significantly accelerate bringing the best ideas to market. Yeah? Now, in a sense, it's um, quite a big experiment because Climate Kick at the moment gets about 80 million euro a year from the Commission. And from a, a standing start six years ago, has delivered more than 2 billion euros worth of climate innovation activity. Um, climate Kick has about 160 staff operating in 18 countries across Europe, and we've got 200. 20 or, or so um, partners. The partners come from uh, the uh, academic and research world, so uh, Imperial College is one of the founding partners, Oxford University, ETH in Zurich, Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact, large corporates, so we have corporates like uh, KLM, uh, Bayer, NG, Veolia, uh, um, Covestro, Knight Frank, uh, but also many cities as well. So we have uh, Copenhagen, we have Malmo, we have Frankfurt, we have Birmingham, uh, Valencia, all, all, all European focused. But Climate Kick also works with hundreds of startups uh, and SMEs because it's the innovation space. And we have a, an alumni, a uh, student alumni of, of more than 2,000 students. So why does Climate Kick exist? Why we originally started with three? Then there were five, now there's six and more planned. So why, does, why do the kicks exist? And why does this collaborative approach to innovation, what, what does it deliver that, that isn't being delivered already? And there are two things which I think are directly rele relevant to the discussion tonight and to climate change. The first is that each of the kicks have been set up to deliver on a major societal challenge. 
clearly climate kick, we're dealing with climate change, which, which is quite a large societal challenge. And there our focus is on finding the best solutions for climate change, mitigation and adaptation, wherever they may be in the world, and helping make sure that they can come in and, and deliver massive impact. But the second driver for all of these knowledge innovation communities is economic, to drive European economic growth. And why is that? Because these major challenges are major business opportunities. Uh, and actually, for me, it goes well beyond business. It's actually a societal um, opportunity to change the way that we do things and do things so much better. So this is, this is the new agenda. This is the new economy uh, and the approaches that we're taking with the kicks and the C40s of this world as well, the collaborative approach uh, is at the core. So on to cities then. So uh, Climate Kick has four um, areas of, of focus and, and cities and urban areas is one of those and it's by far the largest. The reason that it's the largest is because cities give us the biggest opportunity to deliver systemic or joined up solutions. That is joined up ways for planning for cities, joined up ways for developing cities and joined up ways for operating or managing or just living in, in cities. So. Um, Many of the cities that we work with uh, uh, have similar challenges and are focusing in, in similar areas, but they can be quite different in, in how they're approaching them. So just a, a European perspective here. In some of the cities, like many of the Scandinavian cities, it's the city government that's actually taking a, a leadership role in terms of convening and, and, is, and is much more hands-on. In other countries in Europe, central government have, have um, set the foundation under which the cities then come and de deliver their agenda. And in, in a number of, of countries like the Netherlands and the UK, business is leading. And in a sense, it doesn't really matter who's leading. What matters is that we need uh, new and better ways of bringing people together so we can collaborate to deliver on these massive uh, opportunities. And these are opportunities. It's not just doom and gloom. Okay, so I've, uh, to answer John's question properly, I've, I've identified um, four areas where many of the more progressive European cities are, are, are focusing, where they have a, a common focus in terms of dealing with climate change. Um, and I've matched them with a, a climate kick project for each to just to kind of explain the, uh, give an, an explanation of the example. You should see them, I think, they're, yeah, their facade leasing is, is one of them. Uh, up on here. If you want to know more about the projects, then you can look up on the Climate Kick um, website. So the four areas are championing innovation, and particularly open innovation, uh, business model innovation, data and digital, and financing. So on uh, championing innovation and open innovation, these are often uh, forums or platforms for collaboration. I think C40 is a fantastic example of that and is uh, fundamentally needed for, particularly for, for city innovation because of the complexity of the ownership and the stakeholders and all the different people involved. One climate kick program that we have uh, in that space is OASIS and the OASIS program uh, started when a number of insurance and reinsurance uh, companies came together and, and agreed that with the increasing risk from climate change and the ever-increasing uh, uh, uninsured losses, a new approach was required to analyze and price risk from extreme events. The program now has 40 of the world's largest insurance and reinsurance companies uh, working on a range of programs that have the potential to transform the, the world of risk assessment because it's uh, transparent and open. The second area is business model innovation. This, for me, is one of my favorites because actually their huge focus on wonder technologies and wonder solutions, there are huge amounts of fantastic technologies and solutions out there at the moment that don't have traction in the market because they haven't figured out their business model. So one, one uh, small example that we have at Climate Kick is the facade list facade leasing, which I just mentioned before. This was a successful pilot scheme which we ran in the Netherlands that explored how the construction industry can work together to lease building facades as a service based on the value you get from energy efficiency and ventilation control. For commercial buildings at least, uh, this model is likely to significantly extend the life of a building and therefore uh, greatly reduce the whole life cost. The third area is data and digital. Here Climate Kick has um, a a city's flagship program we call Smart Sustainable Districts, where we're working with uh, some of the highest aspiration cities and district scale developments across Europe, all looking to deliver global exemplars of whatever their local um, motivators are. Two areas where all of the cities are active in the uh, data and digital spaces. One is looking at how digital solutions 
uh, can improve engagement with and between the citizens and the stakeholders in the city. And the second area is looking at how they can support a data infrastructure that is safe and secure while opening up all city data to those organizations that can really do something useful with it. And the last area is financing. Oasis has just oh, uh, gone off. Low Carbon City Lab, or LOCAL as we call it, is working with some of the biggest public and private finance institutions to catalyze and accelerate investment into low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure for cities. They're focusing on four areas, training for public bodies, support for uh, project identification and preparation, innovative financing models for the cities, and impact assessments. And maybe just for a very quick finish, 60 seconds, I'll finish on what business in particular is getting out of uh, this type of collaboration and the kinds of things we're doing on climate change in Europe. In early 2016, we undertook quite a detailed piece of work to look at what Climate Kick's value proposition was for our partners. And uh, almost all of the organizations who responded had recognized that many of the solutions uh, that they were developing or that they were looking to implement were systemic solutions, which would require some inputs from many other organizations. So th therefore, most of them saw a huge value in working more openly to uh, better facilitate this, this type of collaboration. The small businesses saw particular value in working with the practical end of academia and the research world in their field, but also in opening a dialogue with potential future clients on their needs at an early stage. And big business appreciated the insight into what innovations were coming over the horizon. They appreciated the ability to access early stage innovators and to be able to connect within a whole value chain. And many of the biggest businesses privately admit actually that their current business model is obsolete uh, in a resource constrained and climate challenged world. And so by participating in this kind of collaborative approach, they see uh, themselves moving quicker and they can see that they get some value from understanding what else is going on through an open innovation ecosystem. With that, thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, <laughs> we're gonna do some clapping for Ian on that one. Crowd pleaser. Um, so, um, Councillor Hulse, um, you've been at the forefront of this stuff for um, many years uh, leading. And um, I guess I'd be really interested in your take on how have we done here? Um, where do we stand right now? What's your vision for where we need to go and how to get there? I do just um, want to acknowledge these fantastic panellists. I, I kind of feel after Mayor Phil's tour de force and telling you what, what we're doing as council, you probably don't need to hear too much more from me and I think we need to mine some of this extraordinary information. But just, you know, to, to build on things a little bit, where have we got to and where are we at now? I my, my gut feeling is we may have been in better places. You know, post the Rio summit, and some of you might not even have been born yet, and Agenda 21 sort of made its way into the world, it felt like a time of huge hope, and everyone was sort of travelling in the same direction, following on from, from that fantastic and what now seems as normal as breathing. But at that time, the idea that we would join the three well-beings and we would focus on climate change was fairly amazing. We... We then slipped back, and in the last little while, as Auckland has grappled with the extraordinary growth we're facing, we've struggled to keep our eye on, on that as the way that we need to go forward. But whilst all of that sounds a little bit negative, the unitary plan happened, and I'm really, really proud of the unitary plan. It's not perfect. There's a whole bunch of stuff we could have done better. But the unitary plan in and of itself is a climate change document. It sets out to be a compact city based around public transport and protecting our fragile places whilst providing for affordable house housing. I mean, that, that to me is pretty good. So post almost post-unitary plan, I think we're well positioned now to pick up the challenge and move forward. But we've got, you know, if you think about council's role, we're planners, we're funders, we're partners in trying to make transformative change. On the planning side, as I said, I think we're doing reasonably well. We've got the Auckland Plan Refresh coming up, and I hope that we get a good steer from our wonderful community, i.e. you, wonderful audience, that we need to push even harder on climate change mitigation, adaptation and avoidance. Funding, however, is going to be our problem, and that's where I think I feel my mood darken a little bit. We're very much pushed on messages of saving rates, saving taxes, saving money, at a time when we've actually never needed to spend more money. 
Auckland in particular is facing some extreme changes and it's no uh, the irony of the fact that our lovely Deputy Mayor Bill Cashmore can't be here because he's flooded in in his farm. The flooding down south has happened in places where there's never been flooding. So climate change is all around us and we're seeing it on a daily basis. Never have we needed to spend more money on sensible ways of managing our stormwater. Never have we needed to spend more money in innovative, soft engineering to actually avoid building redundant infrastructure. Never have we been able or been in need of spending more money with our most vulnerable communities to allow them to afford to actually live in this city. And if we don't invest the money now, we're actually robbing from our children of the future. They won't be able to afford to live in an Auckland that we haven't shored up against the impacts of climate change. Finally, one of our key areas we are feel very hopeful are the opportunities for us to partner and through the lens of avoiding um, making climate change worse, we've got ways of partnering with our community in poverty alleviation projects, in other words, how do we work with our most vulnerable communities, with the tree planting that the mayor talked about, and make those social enterprises? How do we work with our most vulnerable communities to assist them living in houses that are affordable into the future by making sure that they warm, dry, with alternative technologies, powering them so that we shore them up for the future? And how do we work in partnership with government and other agencies to make sure that we in Auckland are not left holding the entire cost of the Central City Rail Link, the Central City Interceptor, which will help manage stormwater, all of the infrastructure that we're needing to invest in. And I think that I'm really interested in how we talk about that partner funding. Finally, the, the probably we're seeing some really visible changes in the way that we're building infrastructure and in particular transport infrastructure in Auckland. But we simply need to make the hard call I don't personally believe that we should be building any more motorways. We are building redundant infrastructure in places that are simply not able to be... I'll get myself into trouble for that. But we're in danger of building infrastructure that is expensive, will be redundant, and is in the wrong place and is not climate change. Um, it's not climate change resilient. So these are all the kind of issues we're facing. We've faced into the wind, we've done some of the hard stuff, but I guess now when I think about our membership of C40, and thank you and for the for fantastic explanation of, of why C40 is so critical, if we're to foot it with those extraordinary cities around the world, we can't rest on our laurels. Auckland's been gifted with much that makes us an extraordinary city to live in, but we're actually slipping behind. If you look at the state of our waterways, our stormwater, the homes that our people live in, and the transport challenges we have. Good on the mayor for moving to an electric car. I think I challenged Lean at a forum like this to get out of his Holden and, and get into an electric car, and it's great that Mayor Phil has. I ride an electric bike every day. I'm very aware of the state of our roads and the lack of infrastructure to make it the easy thing to do. So finally, the more we make it easy for people to make the right decisions for a sustainable and climate change resilient future, the more likely we are to reach that good future. And as council, we actually hold the pen on that. I think um, for those of us who were lucky enough to be at the last C40 meeting in Mexico, we were greeted by a bunch of shell-shocked American mayors who staggered off the plane post the Trump election. And before they got stuck into the tequila and cheered up by the mariachi bands, to a single voice they announced to us that they, I, I'm not going to do, if anyone's worried that I'm going to do my role manual mayor of Chicago impersonation, I'm not. But I'll avoid the expletives, but the message from each of these mayors was, we actually really don't give a rat's ass what our president says. It's the cities that are actually going to stand staunch on all of these issues. And I think that, for me, will last me as long as I live. It's actually cities that make the difference. And I think let's hold on to that. Thank you.
right, so we're nicely warmed up there and quite honest and direct about things. So uh, let's get the conversation really going. And I think some of the magic here of those of you who've been to these conversations before is actually the new understanding and knowledge that's generated in the um, amazing room like this with you as the audience participating as another sector here because we've got civil society and people and residents as well as um, all, the, all the sectors lined up here on the stage. So a key theme I've heard from each four of you is around collaboration and partnership. I'd love to dial down a little bit more into the details on that, whether it be businesses, whether it be um, you know, cities as, a, as an ecosystem, or, um, or even central government and the complexity of different ministries with different responsibilities around climate change. Um, how do we get lined up better operationally with our own, I won't say mess, our own uh, ecosystem, our own um, um, uh, business, and, and actually lead? And, and I guess how do we break down those barriers to collaboration? What are they? And would anybody like to feel the question about digging into the next level there? What, um, how, do you, how do you look at different perspectives? How do you um, build bridges between operations that doesn't talk to a different part of the organization, ministers that might not have the same perspective? Anybody want to feel that one? No one wants? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. I'll feel um, in, a, in a slightly broader context as sure. well, actually, because I wouldn't mind just having a quick response to what I heard from um, Penny, too, which is, my personal motivation and the reason I've been involved in climate change and sustainability for over a dozen years now is because I view this as a huge opportunity. I'm, I have a finance background, right? So I'm a bloody accountant. So I worked for an investment bank. So I've done the evil, but actually I've come in and I look at this thing and I just think it's common sense. And the common sense isn't actually huge amounts of new money coming in. The common sense is just taking what we're already doing and doing it in a joined up and a smarter way, right? So I, I am extremely positive about it, and I really don't think it has to be massive amounts of new money. But the point that we do need is the point you've just raised now, John, which is you, you need the ability to be able to join things up and collaborate. And it really isn't uh, human nature to, to want to collaborate. And one of the things I've seen when we've done a lot of innovation where organizations get together and co collaborate, often they'll break down because the organization itself is not structured in a way where they collaborate. And I hate to say this, John, but some of the worst I've seen have been from uh, local authorities and city governments where different departments just compete with each other on things as well. So the, the question is, uh, how can you? You clearly need leadership from those organizations, but you also need to make sure that there's, there's enough of a prize or a carrot or something where people say, actually, this is worth, worth us doing. But then you need to have the platform. You need to have the environment where people can feel that it's safe to come and, and be open about what they're doing, and they can be guided through it, which is why I think the, the C40s and the kicks and the others of this world are an important part of it. So I'm just keen to build on what Ian's um, talked about. So I've worked in the academic sector, the private sector, and the public sector, and a comment that Ian made really struck me. It's... Um, you know, it doesn't matter who's leading because when I've been in those different sectors, you know, everyone thinks they're, they're leading or others are the laggards, you know, etc. I think for, you know, me, the guts of it was Ian's comment around it um, doesn't matter who's leading, we need to find better ways to bring people together and collaborate. And um, last year, I, you know, I saw a really practical example of it when you had um, government thinking about an electric vehicle package. Um, they invited the public sector, sorry, the private sector in to work with them and there was a lot of testing in that discussion around how that could be done and what that resulted in was a package that just got things going and what you're seeing, you know, springing from that um, is a whole lot more innovation. So, you know, I look at Auckland and the number of um, charging stations you've got around the place hearing about you know, the different partnerships that are springing from that. It was just providing a space to get some collaboration going and um, get something that then people can, can build on. So I think that's really key. Um, in terms of the public sector, um, quite often people um, don't think that agencies are very good at working together. And one of the things that I've really seen happen over the last year is a range of different agencies sitting down and being really straight up with each other about... Um, what they're there to achieve and their different um, outcomes they're responsible for and then how they align some things. And we've now got a group of chief executives from across the natural resource system who have said, actually, 
um, where were the buck stops in terms of how we work together on climate change. It's a joint objective across government. We've got to work out how we work together to make that accelerate, and it's getting different combinations of departments to um, you know, push along different areas. Yeah, I, can, I can add to that in that I think there is still a need for strong and visionary leadership right at the top. That sets the tone for the whole organization to respond. Without that, you do get the, the internal dialogues around, well, should we be going that way? Should we be going this way? Is this a priority? Is it that? You need that strong leadership both from your elected officials, but also within the city administration, the, the city manager, the very senior managers within the city, to get to a set of desirable shared outcomes. What does that vision actually mean? What are the outcomes that we're looking for? And how do we chase those down in our daily operations? And what goes with that set of shared outcomes is shared accountability. Particularly for cities, we must absolutely be publicly accountable and report clearly on the progress we're making, be clear about what is working, what is not working, why it's not working, where we've had that success. And then you can build up that environment that is both supportive from the elected officials who are setting ambitious but yet achievable targets, and then how as an organization we respond as a whole, not each of us within our individual silos playing our small part within that. Yeah, just a little bit more about shared accountability, just thinking about all the sectors together. Um, and, and actually a recent visitor here to New Zealand, I believe it was Lord Devon who came over from the UK um, and talked about the committee, uh, climate change committee that actually sets targets over a long period of time. Um, there's collective accountability. It seems like quite an interesting model. And I'd be curious of uh, perhaps, Penny, your take on a structure like that that seems to cut through some of the, you know, the, the short-term political cycles and kind of the um, here and now and actually gets us to a vision that we need to get to? I think the outcomes we're looking for around climate change, the, the long-term outcomes, um, we're really open to looking at what's worked elsewhere and do we need to be thinking about it. And I think the um, Vivid Economics report that's coming out in March will have um, a range of agencies who will be taking a really good look at that and um, working with ministers about where we go to from here, you know, from that. Right. Any other thoughts there? I might go to Penny. Can I yep. just make a comment? I think that, that economic lens is a critical one. And what we've grappled with is making the lens sophisticated enough so that it is actually future focused. And I'll, I'll be really excited to see this report when it comes out. Because the, the bottom line is if we are unless we have that, and Malcolm, you're absolutely right, unless we've got a very, very clear set of outcomes that's agreed to not only by the council or the government, it has to be agreed by the local, by, by the community and the, and the city themselves, so that when we have to make those difficult financial trade-offs, in other words, you know, if we had had something very, very clear to aim for as a region, we wouldn't have built the Northwestern Motorway without a busway because it was too expensive to do at the time. It would have happened in concert and at the same time because we were working towards a sensible outcome. If we do have those agreed outcomes and they are endorsed by the community, viewed through a sensible economic lens, we should have the right um, decisions made. Just on that, I want to acknowledge my colleague, um, Councillor Chris Darby, who's actually leading the refresh of the Auckland plan, and I think through Chris's work and endeavours on this, that's where I hope that as Auckland we might start to really tie down that long-term plan of where we're going so that government can understand what it is we're doing and why, and business can enrol in a better partnership with us to achieve it, and our community can know what to expect. Another example that jumps to mind is uh, there's an agency in Germany called Agora. And for those of you who are aware of the energy transition, the energy gewende that Germany is undertaking, they are very aggressively getting renewables into the grid in such a way that it's massively disruptive. Governments aren't good with disruption. So the approach that's been taken is Agora is a government-funded agency. They get their money direct from the government. But in essence, they're a think tank. They have a very strong academic base, but from a range of different sectors. They have representation from the industrial sectors, from the utility sector, both wind, solar, so on and so forth. They have economists, finance, um, a very large base. And in essence, the role that they play is to be the future thinking think tank of the utility framework for Germany. 
and what they produce is guidance to the German government on the direction that they should be taking for the structure of their utilities, the rate structure, how you deal with the disruptive nature of renewables, so that the government has independent advice. Even though it's funding the agency, it is independent advice, and they do not have to listen to Agora, but Agora has established its credentials over the, year, so over the years so that the government would be very hard-pressed to deny um, the presence that Agora brings and the thinking that it provides the government. So it's a different, slightly different model. Mm. So I'm trying to troll some of the questions that are coming in on social media and that were sent to us ahead of time. And I wanted to kind of crack into the regulation and innovation space a little bit. Um, you know, there's some who might see them as opposing forces, but can one of you kind of get us into a better understanding of the, the balance between the correct amount of regulation or not um, and how it either spurs or silences innovation? I can jump keep, in on keep that going. one. Yeah. I think particularly for... Any level of government, even though my experience is, is primarily in local government, there is very clearly a role for governments in establishing the sandpit in which business plays. Uh, for 90 years, Keynesian economics has told us that the government has a very clear role to play. But the nature of that role varies over time, depending on what uh, the economic uh, conditions are, what the latest academic penchant is. But really, particularly when we look at the transition to a renewable energy future, if governments over-regulate that market, you're just going to stymie the innovation. There's going to be no uh, change within what's been done. Business will not be able to respond. But then if you under-regulate, you end up with the market failures. Uh, the government has not, is not going to achieve the outcomes that it, it desired. There's that sort of Goldilocks pot of porridge in the middle there that's not too small, it's not too, too big, it's just right. But what does that just right mean? It means that the government is very clear about the direction that regulation is taking and the outcomes that it wishes to see. Not the solutions. The government does not need to specify what those solutions are, but what are the outcomes we wish to achieve? 100% renewable energy. Business, you go, how, how are you going to achieve that 100% renewable energy future? So I think it's, it's a misnomer to think that government complete, can completely step back and let the business community um, take us where we wish to go. Government is there to help form and shape the societies that we're looking for. But finding, finding that sweet spot in the middle for regulation is, I think, one of the defining challenges of the disruptive nature of renewables and the move towards a decarbonized future. Go ahead, Penny. I was going to ask you a question about the market failure and connection to what some might say from a, cri a critical perspective, the ETS, and that, that it doesn't incorporate agriculture, um, and it, as a mechanism to drive change and get the policy settings right, it's not currently achieving what we're hoping it does. Can you say a few things about that from the hot seat? Absolutely. So first of all, I'm just going to um, build on what Malcolm said. So um, absolutely agree with what you said. And I think another role of government can be looking at um, aligning what's happening in policy across government. So some of the work that the OECD has been doing is, is really getting government to take a critical look about are there um, different things that agencies are doing that are actually you know, countering what others are doing. So I think that's really key as well. And another area that I think is critical that I hear CEs talk about a lot is sometimes government just has to work out how to actually get out of the way. So when we've got um, technology change happening so fast, sometimes um, actually working out you know, just how to keep out of the way is really critical. Um, in terms of the ETS, um, part of the reason that we're so focused on the reviews that I talked about earlier is because um, for a number of years the price has been really low. What you've seen is it's starting to rise with the first phase of changes and we're currently um, looking at that next phase because it is such a critical instrument. And as I said earlier, um, there are other things that we need to do. So we're already in talking a lot with the agricultural sector about what are some of the things that we can just get on and start going you know, right, right now in terms of um, change on farm but also you know, huge investment at looking about how we work through some of the innovation needed for some of those really tricky areas in that sector. And do you want to take a few words about, uh, from your perspective from the business sector, how this works in your opinion? Uh, yeah, you can ask a question on innovation. I w w would like to chip in one or two things, definitely, John. So 
And I'm going to um, take it away completely um, uh, from the regulation side and just think about you know, what's required in terms of innovation. Yeah. And so uh, I think New Zealand actually has a fantastic reputation for innovation. And when I've uh, come back now and I'm starting to see you know, who, who the different organizations are and the different schemes and things that are run up, I'm, I'm frankly amazed because there's very little public subsidy or support for it. So, I mean, well done for that. But actually, I innovation is the future. Innovation is the future if we're going to deal with you know, these huge societal challenges, global challenges, um, challenges to mankind, and de deal with them in a way where we really deliver um, real value and get something good from it. So uh, I think it's essential that there is support for entrepreneurial thinking right from you know when kids are at school and through universities and stuff there has to be support for people who, somebody's got a wacky idea how, how do they take that wacky idea and then test it how do they take that wacky idea they've tested it it looks like it's going to work we'll turn it into a company so there needs to be sufficient support mechanisms to be able to support those wacky ideas and the innovation to come forward but actually the biggest thing that that I guess the people on the panel and the people in the room can do is in your day-to-day -day job be prepared to take a risk on some innovation. Be prepared not just to go for the status quo every single time. Don't always go for the safe option. If it's, uh, if it's something that is big and it's really important and you can't risk it, then actually do a pilot or something. But innovate. Go and innovate. Go and trial things. Go and put a call out and say, actually, we want to try. We, we, th this is the aim that we're looking for, as you say. That's what you want to say. This is what we're aiming. Who's got, some, who's got a, a solution for it rather than just saying, actually, here's the way we're going to go and deliver that thing? Because you can do this in your day job. You can deliver a huge amount of it. And I think innovation, I would think, is the future. And I think it's a huge piece of uh, the climate change future. Can I just support that? Often, though, getting the funding to support those wacky and innovative ideas is tough. And one of my current passions, or it's been a passion for a long time, is, is waste and, and rubbish and how we manage things better. One of the most sensible things we could do is to put the price of tonne per landfill up to around $200, and that levy will certainly increase the amount of money available for innovation and waste. And when you've got a serious amount of money like that, that's the time when you do get extraordinary innovation, clever ideas, and the ability to actually back some of our community organisations doing outrageous and clever things that you can then scale up and make change. I, I, love, I love that. To be honest, I think it, that's, that's great. And, uh, I genuinely do, because in, in the future, there is no such thing as waste, right? Every single thing is, is valuable. And so we look back at you know, how we lived 50 years ago. We look back at how people live in societies where they have very few resources. Actually, you make the most of everything. So give it a little kickstart. Put up, put up the price of, of landfill, and that gives it a kickstart. I'm just putting that out there because I may need some help with that. Yeah, OK, great. <laughs> That's great. So uh, you must have been reading the, the sort of the Twitter vibe because uh, a shout out to the Kaipataki Project who had a very similar question. I I'm going to now go to the audience actually um, for some live questions that aren't in digital format. Um, does anybody have first a mic that might be roving around? Um, and can you get it to a question, please? Uh, yes, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to uh, just pose a question to the lady from the ministry. Um, you said that the New Zealand's climate change target is very ambitious. I would challenge that because it's so distant, it's almost meaningless. Other countries have set um, waypoints along the way to their 30 or 40 or 50 year plan. So we can see whether they are on target and actually doing something or sitting on their butt doing very little. Um, and I would strongly commend to you the work of Nicholas Stern, uh, British economist, London School of Economics. I think he was hired by Maggie Thatcher to report to her on the issue of cl climate change, and he basically made the point that if you do little and often, you will get there. If you sit around and do nothing, then you get into a catastrophic situation where the sorts of things you would need to do to deal with climate change will be so huge, they will disrupt the economy. So a question, please, Graham. Well, that is my question. Have you read the work of Nicola Stern? <laughs> And if not, will you please do so and acquaint your employer with, with, with the message? So yes, I have read the work of Nicola Stern um, and agree with you that um, outstanding thinker that um, kick-started a, a whole range of things. In terms of the 
um, little in office often and how does that contribute up to a target. The way I think about it is if we've got a, in terms of that 2030 target, if we've got 235 million tonnes that we have to abate, what does e each particular action that we take get us to that? So, you know, as I, I mentioned before, the electric vehicle package that we've got um, gets us to 0.7, you know, million tonnes, it's, it's pretty low, um, and then with the existing forestry planning we're doing, that gets us 16, so the way we're thinking about it is with a range of different initiatives that are happening, what does that actually do in terms of that abatement target that we've got? So I think, you know, that's a bit of, that's one way of looking at the how are we tracking on getting to where we need to get to. I'm hearing a, a, a quick soon announcement about the next EV uh, innovation fund uh, from, from ICA kind of as part of this. If that's only 0.7, uh, we might need to uh, get that in gear quite quickly. Um, hey, so could you stick your hands up really high and let's take another question from the floor. There's one over here. Yep. Can we get a mic on this gentleman and then over here to the right? Or whoever gets there first, how's that? I guess we're going right here. Thanks. Hi. Um, what do you think we can change in the uh, transport sphere that would create the most, uh, the greatest reduction in um, carbon emissions? Electrify personal transport. You've got a, a, a grid that's 80 plus percent renewable. If you can displace all or a significant proportion of, of the diesel and gasoline use straight to a renewable source, as you have, the gains can be had almost overnight. You can actually look at improving your grid in terms of grid resilience, time of use, loading. You can do shave peak, uh, peak shaving with electric vehicles. The opportunity that comes from electrification of personal transportation alone, let alone what you can do when you start looking at buses, is vast. And that's an opportunity that is unique to very few places in the world. There's not that many places in the world that have an extant electricity grid that is as clean as it is here. You look to some of the Scandinavian countries, Canada, New Zealand. I think another area we've got to think about is the freight um, sector. So um, freight numbers are going through the roof. I know that the Sustainable Business Council is doing some really interesting work at the moment where um, a number of the major companies they're working with are thinking about how they build that into their procurement around um, freight and what they might do to be able to shift some things onto rail, etc. So that, that's another key area. Any other questions from the floor? I see one back there, probably closer to the mic. Could you? Right. Is this on? Okay. We hear you. Um, now, John talked before about the city. Um, Auckland's a different sort of city. It's a regional city. And so instead of standing on the edge and looking in at the concrete, you need to stand on the edge and look out at the part of the green area that's going to save you. And at the moment, um, there's a whole lot of farmers out there who are planting land and uh, sequestering carbon at, a, at the cost of about fifty to $60,000 a hectare. But, but um, I'm just wondering, and maybe Penny or John could answer this, is why council is actually opposing the incentives um, that are there for that planting that the council don't contribute to. It comes through the real estate industry. And I'm talking about um, farmers planting and then getting transferable development rights which are shifted close to town. And why are council opposing that? Is that you or me? Hiya, Mark. Yep. I, um, and I, I know that this has been raised in the unitary plan. I think it's still an issue we need to resolve. My, do you want the kind of quick and dirty answer for me? I don't think we've probably thought it through sufficiently to work out, rather than looking at these issues through unitary plan eyes, in other words, what can we develop where and how, I don't think we've addressed it from a carbon sequestration issue. Is that a useful answer? Probably not. Haven't got any wiser words for you other than I think we could do better on that one. 
And I guess I'd only add that there are mechanisms that seem to work pretty well in other places. Um, a bit of a hat tip to those in the audience in the front row here, um, like the transfer of development rights or tax increment financing and, you know, tools that we need to look at a lot more seriously because they tend to deliver some positive outcomes in other places. The context might be different. The policy drivers might be different, but um, we should be more open to those ideas. Question in the back there. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. Um, the uh, mayor spoke earlier on about um, the growth in the city. We've got nearly a thousand people a week coming into this city, which is half the immigration for the country. Um, do the panel think that we have to have growth in the in the model we've been accustomed to in the last 30 years, which is increasing population? an increasing GMP? Do we have to have growth? It seems to me backwards. Does somebody want to frame the opportunity of growth? Answer. Well, I, while the panel think, <laughs> uh, and I think we're quite lucky that Graham didn't ask that question. This is usually your question, <laughs> isn't it, Graham? Um, so, you know, starting from the, the wider issue of growth. We Not only is it people coming into the country, it's people returning to the country and the fact that we're quite fecund and a lot of us are having quite a lot of babies. Not me, but you know, part of our community. So we, we need growth to regenerate our, our, our city and our country. And if you look at the baby boomers and who's around to actually support people in their old age, we've actually got a shrinking bunch of young people who will actually support those of us that are rapidly growing and ageing. So growth in and of itself isn't bad. It's what we do with it. And I'm pretty much a glass half full person. I think growth offers huge opportunities. I hardly think we're chocker by world standards. It's what we do and how we manage the potential of growth in a way that doesn't exacerbate the mistakes of the past. If we use it well and use it wisely, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for us. So I don't buy into the let's close the doors, we're full model. I will say, however, wouldn't it be great if we shared some of that with our beautiful cities like Dunedin, all the infrastructure in the ground, everything going for it. Let's share the joy. <laughs> there, there's one thing that um, I flicked up on the screen in my opening where you saw graphs going up, which would be population and GDP, and you saw carbon impacts coming down. And that wasn't per capita. That was overall. So I guess if we look to the rest of the world, you kind of can have your cake and eat it too. You can kind of have, have it both ways. It's just those decisions you need to make to get there. How about another? We've got about five or so minutes left. You're a very patient crowd. We've got a question right in here from, from Dr. Ann. Can we get a mic here? Right in the front. Oh, cool, cool. Um, Anne Smith from Environment Solutions. Um, so building on the theme that we've just heard and, and also yeah, desperate to name, name drop that I... Just yeah, a little and, and, and desperate yep. to name drop that I was lucky enough to talk to Lord Stern in October. Um, so at the Stern Plus 10 conference, they pointed out very clearly, speaker after speaker, that the built environment, 50% of the built environment in 2030 has not yet been built. Now this is going to happen to Auckland and all of the big cities and the infrastructure and buildings that we're, we've already started building, if they're not low carbon, you're locking in high carbon for 100 years. So to build on that, I was lucky enough to be the sustainability manager for a very large university that built the biggest brownfield development in Europe with their new campus. And we had, this was 2000, and, you know, in the early 2000s, we had one of the most sustainable campuses. We spent money on, you know, life cycle assessment of almost every large purchase. We came to the conclusion once it had been built that unless everybody lived and worked sustainably in those buildings, it didn't matter a damn how efficient they were, how sustainable they were, it was going to rely on how we lived and worked in those buildings. Now, two big challenges there. First of all, what are we doing to, to make all of the infrastructure that's going into Auckland now low carbon? And what are we doing about making it so people can work and live sustainably using that infrastructure? Just another easy question for the panel. Um, thanks, Anne. 
does anybody want to take that one on? How do we embed low carbon into our long-term infrastructure decision making? I think it's an excellent question because we have to is one of the easiest answers, but how to do that, um, there might be some insights from the panel. I, I think when we start to first to absolutely acknowledge the point that the decisions we make in the next five years lock in our future for the next hundred years. We really are at that crux. This is the time to start making the decisions. We should really have been making those decisions 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago, but the reality we face is we have to make the decisions now. We no longer lack the information, knowledge, and foresight that should be driving those decisions. For me, when I think about infrastructure, really it's about more rapid development times. At the moment, it takes too long to develop infrastructure. And by the time it gets to market and completion, the landscape has changed. Not the physical landscape, but the landscape that it was there to serve. So it's about more rapid development cycles for infrastructure and also doing a much better job of predicting the future needs of that infrastructure. One of the classic examples that really jumps to mind is there's no denying that autonomous vehicles are starting to come to market and can potentially come to market very rapidly. But for those autonomous vehicles to go into an underground parkade, they need a cell phone repeater. Underground parkades are not currently set up for cell phone repeating, so we have to go through, and if those vehicles are going to be able to use that infrastructure, we now need to retrofit and put a whole set of infrastructure in place. It's those insights into technology forward, and, and it's the future proofing. But at the same time, I think we have to recognize that we cannot wholly predict the future. So our infrastructure starts needs to start to become much more adaptive to a changing climate, to changing demographics, to changing technology. It can no longer be that rigid, brittle, unresilient infrastructure that we're used to today. So I think we just need to completely reimagine what infrastructure planning and infrastructure deployment actually looks like, whether it's Auckland, Vancouver, any city you wish to name. Can I just, just very two, two very quick points. The, the, the first one is just to build on what Malcolm just said, which, which is that the infrastructure of the future is modular, right? I mean, you're looking at different things. So we, we'll be able to take things and pull them apart and, and update them as we go. The second is I've done a, done a lot of work with the infrastructure providers in, in London. And I have to say, having worked in a number of different sectors, the infrastructure sector, particularly the utility sector, is one of the most... Uh, backward industries ever. So the, the potential for efficiencies from actually some joined upness and putting an infrastructure in a joined up in, in a coordinated way, enormous potential for, for carbon saving and, and financial saving. So we, um, if, if my stomach was through the microphone, you would have heard that it's about dinner time for a lot of us. So I don't want to hold people captive. We're going to try to wrap this up. Um, but I think to do so, I've, I've got a couple lightning round questions that could be answered in maybe one word or one quick phrase. Um, what's one um, thing you need from another sector, from where you're sitting now, to make yourself successful? Sorry to spring that on you, Malcolm, but you're closest to my right. <laughs> in, in one word. Um, visionary thinking. Penny? Collaborate. Mm. Yeah, I think openness to collaborate. I'm oh, mine's to generosity and kindness. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and then what's one thing you'll commit to do in the next month as a result of this conversation to keep us moving that direction? Let's go the other way. Sorry to put you on the spot, uh, Councillor Hulse, but... I want to read the economic report that Penny's talking about. Sounds fantastic. Stern's on the homework list for, for Penny. Oh, no, not that one. Sorry. No, I'll, I'll get Graham to pricey that for me. No, is it the Vivid, is it the uh, vivid yes. Economics Report? Yeah. Yep, and that'll be launched uh, later both in Auckland, Christchurch, and I think Wellington, um, and later this month. Excellent. Uh, I will personally talk to each person on this panel about how I can help and what they're doing going forward, John. <laughs> Excellent. Looking forward to that conversation. <laughs> I'm going to follow up with Penny around um, the waste area. So we've been talking a lot in the ministry about the circular economy and um, with the money that's collected through that waste levy, we're really interested in looking at some different ways to get to different solutions. So we'll be in touch. As long as you ask me... Anything that's professional, I'll get it done. <laughs> We're not going to ask a follow-up question to that one. Um, so, hey, let's give our panel a, a great round of applause for their participation.
and no Auckland conversations would be quite complete without a really um, very vocal vote of thanks. And we are lucky enough to have Councillor Chris Darby, who chairs the planning committee, here to do just that. So let's shut down the show. Councillor Darby. Uh, 